together. Matthew chapter 21, familiar words, starting in verse 1. Now when Jesus, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The tribute to how critical this is is found in this, that each of these uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them record this same event. It's one of those rare occasions where each of the four Gospels declares this exact moment which tells us the significance of that moment. They said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. The word that I want to press into you this morning is that word that they use right there, the word Hosanna. It'll be the founding point that we start from, and then we're moving further. If you've been here for a while, you already know that hope is one of my most celebrated subjects. Uh, I never get tired of talking about hope. If you get next to me more than five minutes, we're going to try to stir up something in you. It is one of my favorite subjects, and I like to preach on it as often as I can. My favorite understanding of it is that hope is a confident anticipation and an expectation that something good is about to happen. I love to be around hope. I love the atmosphere of hopeful people. It is believing that everything will turn out for the best. That is what hope is. And on this Palm Sunday morning, the word that we're going to press is the word Hosanna. But the word that is pressing right behind that is that word hope this morning. We want to impart hope into your life. Let's pray together. Father, give us ears to hear and a heart to respond. Let everything that we do and everything that we say, God, testify that Jesus Christ is in this place. And you desire to change our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. And they said together, amen. amen. Every year. People approach these seasons in different ways. I know that it's been that way in my life for many, many years, that every year as we approach these few weeks, uh, something about it all takes me way back. It takes me all the way back to that little country church that I grew up in, the little country church where y'all know the story, how it, you knew everybody there, and you knew every car in the parking lot, and you knew everybody who was going to show up on that Sunday because it was always us. It, something about these weeks takes me back every year to, to that memory, and I'm not really sure why. But I am sure of this, that the further I go down the road into this contemporary version of Christianity that you and I happen to be living in, I am happier that I was raised in a much different day. I might be alone in that, but I am happy that I was raised in a much different day day than we are right now. These days, pretty much everything in the world has to be a production. And unfortunately, that has begun to seep into the church. Uh, the church world, we, 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 we've bought into that. We're starting to believe that everything in the, in the church world also has to be a production. And, and I want to be clear before anyone misunderstands what I'm saying, that I, I'm, I'm not by any means throwing shade on any of that because over the course of all these years, we've pretty much done all of it, and, and I definitely understand the importance of getting the word out and letting people know what is going on, but these days, everything, everything, everything has got to be this big event. It's got to be bigger, bigger, bigger. There has to be a, a attention to agenda and to marketing and to themes and signs and banners and stages are redecorated and, and, and all of that, I swear, I think we would put dancing bears on the service stage on Sunday if we could. <laughs> Oftentimes, exorbitant amounts of money are spent, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. 
So, so before you say, our pastor hates marketing, that's not true. But the older I get, the stronger feeling that I have is that something is missing. Is that something is missing. And in our attempts to cover it up, whatever it is that is missing, we have this form of godliness, but we are denying the power thereof. And so in order for us to cover up what might possibly be missing, we have to pump it up. And we have to pump it up, and we have to make it a little bit more and a little bit bigger and a little bit more fantastic. Each thing has to be a little bit more. Nobody's saying nothing, so I'm all by myself. But in the way that we determine if it works is by how big it was. Was it great? Was it awesome? Was it amazing? Did everybody just swoon when they saw what you did? And, 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 and for me, it stands in a startling contrast to those small, simple services and those, those Sunday school lessons that we sat in, that we reveled in. Before all of that other stuff took over, it, was, it seems to me that it was much more humble. And it was much more revered by all of us. And as I climbed down off of my soapbox this morning, <laughs> uh, it all began on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into the streets of Jerusalem. And I've always loved the imagery of it all, and I've always loved the significance of it all, because every image that you see there is significant. The fact that he rode in on a donkey is significant as it fulfills the messianic prophecy of him giving in the book of Zechariah chapter 9 where it said, Behold, your king is coming. He is lowly, sitting on a donkey. And as Jesus rode in, I believe that a part of the excitement that they were all feeling that day was that feeling that they had that this is really happening. This is happening in my lifetime. It's happening right in front of my eyes. And they couldn't contain themselves. And that is why you see the excitement that they had on that day. It is called Passion Week. And that word passion means to suffer or to endure. And that is significant because it reminds us that Jesus suffered and he bled and he died for the sins of the world. We, we cannot allow ourselves to get so far down the road that we forget to take time to stare at the cross and realize that the brutality of it all was for us. He suffered, he bled, he died, he endured the shame and the suffering that he went through so that you and I could be born again. It, it's... It's not about bunnies and eggs and more candy. It's not about that. It's about that. It is about his sufferings that he went through. And that as, as it began, one of the most recognized and most significant elements of it all was the waving of the palm branches and the shouts of the crowd as he rode in, as they all said together, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And even as a child in Sunday school with an underdeveloped understanding of the theological implications of what that really meant, there was something about that that excited my soul. In its simplest terms, our teachers explained it for us like this, that the word Hosanna means God save us. It means save us. In stronger terms, some scholars say that it was an imperative that means save us now. As if it was an urgent cry from their hearts that, that we might not have this moment again. So God, save us in this moment and save us right now. And it is an expressive cry that asks God to help you in that moment, in that situation. So what we know is that in that moment, they were crying out for the help of God. And what they were doing was expressing their hope that this moment was going to change their lives forever. And I've always loved that because that was them saying something that we all need to be saying more than we do. God, we need you and we need you now. God, we, 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 in America, we're not suffering yet. We still think we can make it on our own. But we all need to be crying out the same words. God, we need you and we need you now. We need that in our world today. Hope is believing that something good is about to happen. Hope is believing that no matter what I'm facing what I'm dealing with, or whatever it is that I'm going through, before this is over, something good is going to happen. And even for me, all the way back then, and I go all the way back then, even as a child sitting in that Sunday school class on a cold steel folding chair with no real problems of, y'all remember those cold steel folding chairs? In the wintertime, you were like, do we, do we really got to sit on that? 
I remember it stirred me up that what was running through that crowd was expectation. We should never take that for granted because whenever you find yourself in an atmosphere where there is an expectation, you should prepare yourself because God is about to do something. The atmosphere of expectation is always the breeding ground for a miracle. Last week at the altar invitation, the Holy Spirit interrupted. I don't know how many people actually caught that, but I was going in a particular direction at altar service, and I was leaning in a particular direction, and just as I was leaning in that direction, I felt it just as tangible as anything I've ever felt. God just stopped me and turned in a different direction. And when I said the words into this church, who needs a miracle? Do y'all remember that? Seven days ago, there was a perceptible surge in this room. I could feel it. There was a perceptible surge in the room when the altars opened. There was a movement, y'all. There was a movement. And what caused that movement was the tangible presence of hope. Somebody expressed it, man. There is hope for you. There is miracles happen. There's an opportunity here. God is moving. Now is your time. The reason I'm pressing this is, is, is meaningful for me today. And I'm going to share it with you. Several weeks ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about a mutual friend who had an experience in her church that should have never happened. An experience in the church that she was attending that should have never happened, and it was the spark that lit the flame for this service that I'm giving you, this sermon that I'm giving you this morning. On this particular Sunday, there was a mother who had brought her child to church, and that child had cancer. The report was not good. The child had cancer, and if God didn't intervene, something worse was going to happen. And so the woman asked this particular lady if she would pray to pray for this child. And so she did. And when she prayed for her, she prayed in faith, believing that God was going to heal her, that God was going to heal her child. She took authority, as we should, over sickness and disease. She spoke scripture like she believed it. She spoke life as the scripture commands us to do, that death and life are in the power of our tongue and we should speak life. She spoke healing into that child's life. I wish I would have been there to hear it. But somewhere along the way of her prayer, as she was praying for that child, she specifically mentioned the word hope. And the phrasing that she used was given to me that she said, don't lose your hope. Don't lose hope because God is able to do this. And she said, put your hope in him because God can do this. And the story was relayed to me that immediately at the end of that service, the pastor of that church grabbed her by the arm and took her over to the side. And before they even left the sanctuary that day, the pastor took her by the arm, took her over to the side and said, don't ever do that again. True story. Don't ever do that again. Don't ever say that in prayer. Don't ever speak to someone like that because what you are doing is giving them a false hope. Because what you are asking God to do is impossible. I love your exclamations. What I'm saying is that that is exactly what God wants us to do. That is exactly what God wants us to do. God wants us. God wants us to stir up hope in one another, to cause us to believe that everything is possible and that God can do it all, to give people hope and to know that God wants us to ask him to do the impossible. In Hebrews chapter 4, the scripture says, let us come boldly into the throne room of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of our need. In Jeremiah 32, God said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That is like God saying, Are you know, Do you know who I am? He is, he is the God who opened up the Red Sea and let them pass through. He is the God who raises people from the dead. He is the God who opens blinded eyes. Y'all, He is the God who walks on water, y'all. And some half wit, takes somebody by the side and says, don't say that. I hope to God she says it until she runs out of air. You could preach this 52 weeks in a year and it would never be enough to say it. Never lose your hope. Never lose hope, y'all, because God is with you. Never lose hope because God is able. Never lose hope because he hears you when you call. Never lose hope because he is the God who is able to make a way where there is no way. Never, never lose your hope because in the very next moment, God could turn everything around for you in a way that no one could have possibly believed. Never lose your hope just because somebody else lost theirs. 
I love that. Never lose hope because his name is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, even cancer and depression. Never lose your hope. Amen. Now watch this. The problem is not whether or not hope exists. <laughs> the problem is how quickly it evaporates. <laughs> the problem is how quickly it evaporates. You can be filled with hope, y'all. I need somebody to testify. You can be filled with hope through a song, a sermon, a prayer, or the encouragement of a friend. I mean, you can have all the hope in your, I mean, your soul is on fire, and in less than 15 seconds, it's gone. Nod your head. You know I'm telling you the truth. I wish anger evaporated as fast as hope does. <laughs> Whew. My home life would be so much better. I do, don't y'all? If everything else evaporated as quickly and completely as hope does, we'd have a much better life. The spiritual element of it all. It has to be a spirit thing because of, of how the enemy is determined to snatch it away from you as fast as he can. He doesn't want you to have it. He doesn't want you to have this hope in you that something good is about to happen. And so he snatches it away as quickly as he can. And it's always amazing to me how he chooses to do that. You can be sky high in your faith. Believe in God and even confessing it. Man, God is good. Amazing things can happen. God is going to do something. And all it takes is for one person to come up and say, well, I don't know. I did that when I did one day, and it didn't work out for me. And the next thing you know, here you go tripping. <laughs> My favorite thing is when somebody comes to me and says, well, you, you know what, you, you, you just need to calm down. <laughs> People haven't said that to me in years. Because what I always said is, I don't need to calm down. You need to get fired up. Yeah. I don't need to calm down. I'm not going down there. You need to come up. Or... If he can't snatch it away from you, what he will do is one of his favorite tactics is that he will substitute it somehow very subtly with that true thing, false hope. False hope, which is just as destructive as no hope at all. So the preacher brought it up, so I'm going to bring it out. Never say that because you're giving them false hope. False hope is rooted in me. False hope says I can do this. But real hope is anchored in God. Amen. False hope drowns in despair, while hope is always expecting God to do something. False hope stumbles when setbacks happen, but hope says, God must be going to do this another way. See, some of y'all, you, you've been thinking that God's going to do it a particular way, and when that setback happened, it caused you to trip out. What you should be saying is, my hope tells me that God must not going to be doing it like that. God's going to be doing it some other way. So however God wants to do it, I'll just say, okay. False hope is built on sinking sand, while hope is built on a firm, solid foundation. False hope is the drug addict who says, I can do this on my own. No, you cannot. While hope says who the sun sets free is free indeed. So I'm just going to let God do this his way. False hope, church. False hope says baptism, church membership, and good works is going to be enough. Hope says you must be born again. And I'm not just leaning on those words. I'm leaning on his everlasting arms. False hope. False hope says I hope that I have been good enough to make it into heaven. Oh, man, let me kick that one in the rear end, y'all. <laughs> Hope says rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. <laughs> nobody, nobody who goes to heaven is going to make it by the skin of their teeth. You're going to do it the same way everybody else has. You're going to run through the gate shouting that God lets you come into his heaven. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> False hope. False hope says, well, maybe it'll get better. While hope says, I'm believing the word of God that the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines brighter and brighter to a perfect day. Not only can it get better, but God says it will get better. I'm counting on it. When was your worst day? Yesterday. You should always be able to testify and say, my worst day was yesterday. 
Today God is with me. False hope. Man, I, I love this feeling. Fal, false hope lives with despair and depression. Oh, I guess I've, that's just my lot. I just, I've just i got to work it out. While hope says the joy of the Lord is your strength. False hope. Says this mug that I'm mired in ain't so bad after all. I guess I can wreck it and make it out the rest of my life. But hope says he lifts me out of that miry clay. And he sets my feet on a solid rock to stay. False hope says maybe I'll make enough money this week to be able to keep my bills paid and keep my lights turned on. But hope says my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Are y'all hearing me? I'm not just believing in that. I'm believing in the promise that God's going to supply my needs, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Anybody else want to claim that with me? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. God's going to do it. Press down, shaking together, and running over. That's what hope feels like, y'all. You need it. More than you think you do, you need it. You need hope in your life. We all lose it sometimes. Anybody? We all lose it sometimes. And what you need are people in your life who will stir you up to believe it. Not someone who tries to steal it away. And if you don't have anybody like that in your life, God will do it for you. Musicians and singers, come on. I preached myself right out of a job. <laughs> Hope. I said that if you don't have somebody in your life like that, God will do it for you. I remember this this morning that I was laying on my hosp- laying on my back in a hospital bed one night in August of last year. Whatever it was, it happened again. And I was laid up on my back in the middle of COVID. No one could come. No one could visit. You're just alone. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I've told you this story many times because it is a black eye to the devil. And when I woke up, there were five doctors standing around my hospital bed. And they said, you have a blood infection. You're going into sepsis. And if you go into sepsis, your organs are going to fail, and you're going to die. So they said what we're, the best we can do is that we're going to try 24-7 antibiotics. Every two hours, we're going to change the bag, and we're going to try to figure out what's going on, so we'll see if we can do anything. I was laying alone on my back in that bed all alone that night, about 3 o'clock in the morning. And I had that come to Jesus minute. Okay, God, I'm 59 years old. It's been good been a good life if this is your will I'm okay with that but if it's not I'm not going to let the enemy take me out before it's my time and laying there on that on my back on that bed God spoke to me four words four words get back to work I don't know how God speaks to you, but he talks to me like I'm one of his kids that needs a boot in the butt. Get back to work. He said, yes, sir. And here I am. Back to work. So, hope, hope. Hope says greater things are still to come. Hope says my story hasn't even started yet. Man, I saw something yesterday one of my friends shared on Flakebook that said, I couldn't believe it, man. I, I had to look it up. It's true. It said the most productive years of your adult life are the years between 60 and 70 years old. So all you young people, sit down and shut up. Man, old people got it burning now. Between 60 and 70, I'm going to get more done than I did when I was young and strong. Er, we're going to make some stuff happen, y'all. Isn't that amazing? My story hadn't even started yet. That's, that stirs my hope. 
Hope says God can use all of it. All of it for His glory. Hope says this mountain that I'm staring at will be moved in Jesus' name. The significance of this story. I love this, and this is where we tag it all together for us all here this morning. The significance of this story for me is that you can have your own Hosanna moment anytime you want to. Oh, I almost danced right there. It looked like a white man throwing up. but yeah. I almost danced. That's all I had. That thrilled my soul, man. You can have your own Hosanna moment anytime you want to. Woo! So, so they hand you the paper and say, we're going to evict you Friday. Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna. However it works, whatever it means to you, you can have your own Hosanna moment. God, save us. God, help us. I'm crying this out in the moment of my greatest need. I need you, God. Save me. Help me. And no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, if you cry out, Hosanna, you're saying the exact same word. God, save me. God, help me. I can't make it on my own. But with you, nothing can stand against me. This morning, the palm branches are laid down and the king comes riding in. They cry out, Hosanna. And God saved them and God helped them. He'll do the same thing for you. The heads bowed, open your hearts with me this morning. Father God, I don't know what this word says to each of us, but I pray that it will speak loudly. Father, I pray that your word would be heard in this place and beyond. God, people right now needed to hear this people at the point of their greatest need their greatest challenge right now father i pray that this word would be heard hosanna 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 in my moments of sickness hosanna in my moments of brokenness hosanna when everything has fallen apart hosanna when i don't have enough Hosanna when my mind is shattered. Hosanna when I have failed again. Hosanna. God save. God help. And save now. This morning with heads bowed and hearts open. Last week when I said who needs a miracle. I felt it in my soul. And so many souls in this room moved forward quickly to pray I need a miracle in my life this morning I'm asking again who needs a miracle I'm asking this morning who is at a moment of need in your life God I need you and I need you now but before we do that can we just pause for a moment and say that the most important need that you have is the need to be right with God you need Jesus in your life. You need to be born again. You need to be right with God. So this morning, before we forget, before we move quickly to the other things, I just pray that if there's anybody sitting here this morning that you're not walking with God and your heart's not right with God, maybe you're the prodigal son or daughter, maybe somehow you just stumbled into church this morning and you just know, I need to make things right with God. Your personal Hosanna moment could be that exact thing. Hosanna, God save me today. I want to make things right between you and I. I want to have peace with you. When I give the invitation for prayer, I want you to come. Find a place to pray and let God do something in your life. For everyone else, me included, if you're standing here, sitting here this morning, and there are things in your life that you just, you need God's help with, whatever that might be. God, I need you. Here and now, here and now, Let's just see what God can do with that. Struggling with depression? Hosanna. Help me. Struggling in your family? Help me, Lord. God, I need you. My family needs you. My kids need you. My grandkids need you. God, help me. Struggling with addiction. Help me. You can't do it on your own. You can't make it on your own. But who the sun sets free 
is free indeed. He can break those chains. He can set you free. Somebody's struggling with, with so much anxiety in your life. You, 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 you have panic attacks constantly. False hope says, I'll try harder. I'll do better. But real hope says, God, I need you. So God, help me. All across the building, if you wouldn't mind, everyone together, just stand, please. Altar workers, I pray to God that you came to church this morning ready to meet people at the point of their greatest need. So this morning, in the name of Jesus, if you're here and you have a need in your life of any kind, and that need has maybe, maybe even that need has brought you here this morning, can you cry out together, God, save us, God, help us, God, help me. Put this back together again. God, I need you like I've never needed you before, and I'm not leaving here until I bow my knee and confess my need for you. So this morning, if you guys will lift your voice. Amen. 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 How many in here, y'all, have ever had a really close to death, near death experience? Can I see? What in the world kind of people are y'all? One of my favorite sayings needs to become yours. The devil should have killed me when he had a chance. I want you to hang on to that. I'm going to hang on to that because you're going to need that. What a blessing it is in the house of the Lord today. That that you're feeling, that's hope. That's what that feels like. All things are possible. God hasn't forgotten you. Your best days are coming. God can make a way. He can, ha- he can do it. The devil is a liar. Praise the Lord. It's one of those days I don't want to go home. Because Kathy's mean to me. It's not true. We were joking with a waitress last night in Palm Coast, and the lady thought she was serious, and she was like, do you need me to call somebody? I'm like, calm down, lady. Calm down. Reach out, if you will, take somebody by their hand. We ain't afraid of it. The word today is Hosanna. Next Saturday and Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. The sermon is the good news is the bad news was wrong. I'm looking forward to speaking into anyone's life that will have an ear to hear. This morning I'm praying that this word of hope is stirred up in you. If you've had a miracle lately, I want to hear about it. If you've given your life to the Lord today, if you reconfirm that commitment, I want to hear about it. We need to know. God is doing some amazing things. We're so blessed to be a part of it. Father, we just put our hearts together in prayer this morning, thanking you for what you are doing. God, thanking you for the season that we are in. God, I pray for your people that God hope would be real. That, Father, we would not be downcast, but we would put our hope in you, God, knowing that we will not be ashamed, we will not be determined, we will not be let down. God, today in the name of Jesus, We pray that as we go, you go with us. God, let us today do what we can to reach the people that need you in Jesus' name. And they said, amen. Amen. As you're walking out this morning, two things give on your way out. You spell million, M-I-L-L-I-O-N. Stop and grab one or two of these crosses, if you will, please, and take them with you. Amen. God bless you. This week, sometime, drop it somewhere.